we are really honored to host Tufa Jalo this afternoon in Guatemala. Tufa, welcome. We're honored to have you. Thank you so much for having me. How did you first get involved with human rights organizations and advocacy work? And what inspired you to become an activist? My activism came to me, I mean, it happened because I spoke out in 2019. After it takes great courage. I, I would think. Um, yes. I, I, I did what I did because I needed to breathe again. Um, I was violated when I was a teenager. You know, I'm sorry I, to hear I, that. I left my country and I was a refugee uh, outside of the Gambia and finally got uh, a protected status in Canada and I've lived in exile uh, for all those years until we ousted the dictator. Uh, but for me personally, for my personal growth and, and, and surviving of violence against the most powerful person in my country was, was a truth I could not share with anybody, not even my family or friends. Um, and it was killing me. It really was. How old were you when this happened? I was 18 years old. So very, very young. Very young. I grew up in a culture where conversations around rape is a taboo. We mm -hmm. don't discuss rape. We don't discuss violence. We don't even discuss sexuality or sexual parts. So for you to talk about someone violating you requires you opening up about your body and the harm that has been done to it. So I never thought I would speak of it, not only because of the taboo around rape, but also the power of the man who raped me. Um, but in 2019, after so much therapy and work and realizing that I can't live... Through, th through therapy? I went through a lot of therapy. That was kind of your background or what encouraged you? Part yeah. of your healing process? It was. Because I, I went to therapy to heal, not because I thought I would speak out. But as we went on, me and my therapist realized that... Because I've always been an outspoken person, you know? I've, I've you always... seem very brave and cor courageous. I, I like to speak my mind and for to be to be silenced for those many years uh, killed me in so many ways and in order to become who I am, in order to fully live authentically as myself, I had to say what happened to me. Tell me a little bit about your uh, personal process to make up your mind. How tough was it? What did you wait out? What did you consider? Yeah. I mean, new ones and tough questions like that is why I wrote a book. I actually have a book out. Um, What's the title of the book for the... Tufa, A Woman That Inspired an African Me Too. Yeah. So in it, I just detailed the process because I realize interviews and headlines do not really cover um, what it's like to get to that place. And, I, and in order to inspire other young people, I wanted them to see that journey, to understand how I got there. Um, and there's many different factors besides what I, what I told you. It's also me trying to find inspiration from other survivors and realizing that I could not find any Gambians online. Um, I remember a day where I went to my desktop and I was trying to Google Gambian rape survivor so I can put a face to what has happened to me um, because there's no way it had only happened to me, right? So I, I needed another Gambian to relate to. Unfortunately, I couldn't find visible survivors, people with their faces and their stories. Um, it was just World Health Organization numbers and stories and statistics. And that really impacted my decision to speak out because I said to myself, we don't have Me Too stories that are visible. And it's not like it's not happening. It's happening. We are just so indebted to this culture of shame and taboo that no one comes out and speak up. So now part of my biggest pride is when I go to Google or when you go to Google and you type rape or women's rights and Gambia, you see a lot of articles, a lot of stories, a lot of developments that have happened ever since. So for me, that's, that was one of the main reasons why I spoke out. What I hear is that you, you do a lot of work that is transnational. You seem to be based in Toronto but working closely with Gambia and in The Hague. Yeah. How, how do you get, how do you stay connected to Gambia in this multinational level? Yeah. I, I, I go to Gambia a lot. Um, last year I was working on a documentary documenting the lives of uh, survivors of violence. Uh, some who are not with us anymore, they passed away. 
Uh, a very vivid one is a woman named Mariama, who was a military uh, officer and was raped and impregnated by the president. Um, and in order to hide that secret, she was gone down in the middle of our highways, right? So this happened years ago when I was a little girl. But how do we bring back that story into the limelight? So I had to go to Gambia, interact with the families, document what their lives have been since they lost the breadwinner of the family, but also to tell the true story of what happened to her. Because what the, the government said at the time is that she got into a problem with the husband and she killed herself and killed the husband, right? A suicide murder. But that's not what happened. So for me to tell that story from the lens of her son, um, whom she left behind, and her mother and her father, and her colleagues, people that knew her, to humanize her and to retell her story was very important. So I, I spent like six months in the Gambia working on content like that. Um, I go three months at a time sometimes. So I'm very much connected to the Gambia. Again, participating in the transitional justice process, uh, the Truth Commission testifying there as well. Uh, but also seeing Gambia as a piece of a bigger puzzle you know, the impacts of dictatorship on small countries like the Gambia, um, the poverty, you know, if you look at the rate of girls dropping out of school, um, the world not seeing us for who we are, having our entire identity be captured by one man and one man only. Um, so in order to make any strides and, and, and development and respect for the rule of law for Gambia, we have to learn from other playbooks around the world, right? We have to understand uh, successful transitional governance as well. Because in as much as we don't have the 22 year dictator right now, we are in a very fragile state with a military that has been funded and enabled for years. So we can lose it. We can lose it anytime. Uh, so for me, it is very multi-dimensional. It is for democracy. It is for women's participation. It is for women's rights, it is for uh, participating in the governments that we want, because when we do have the governments that we want, you know, true democracies, women thrive, women thrive, perpetrators are held accountable, and people can speak up without having the fear or feeling like they could be killed anytime. Let me thank you on behalf of uh, College Freedom Forum, um, your very inspiring words. I see a very strong, powerful, courageous woman who is thriving. And I'm honored to have shared the stage with you as you deliver these powerful messages. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening and for creating the space. It is very important to share our stories because whether it's Latin America or Africa or North America, um, the stories that I work with and my story, it's very similar very, very similar. So it's important that we all recognize that we are the same and we are not alone and changes anywhere is good change for all of us. So thank you for having me. Thank you.